Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jacob Bong. I'm the executive director of Hong Kong IAS. Uh, before we usually invite uh, some senior scholars to give a lecture, uh, most of them are uh, academician or fellow of some US or Europe uh, uh, academy. But now they are not coming during this uh, pandemic, so we are kind of worried about it. So we are trying to do some new things. So we invite our CTU rising star, one professor to give a lecture. And this uh, event is held by a lot of the committee. Each category, like the study we have uh, many senior uh, senior fellow or professor from a committee. And they nominate and they elect and vote and finally we come up with three rising stars. Yeah. And of course, we have some other stars. They are not rising, they are already stars. So that's why they're not uh, here. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of good people. So maybe in next semester or in the future, uh, when we still have good funding, then we can have some other series uh, to promote young scholars. And you know, all the lectures today and also all the other series in chemistry, physics, computer science, life science, with the video recorded and published to our, our website. And, and also we will write some articles and facts to newspaper, social media, and also to nature and science magazine. So all the, your story, your lecture will be covered uh, worldwide. So many people will know what you're doing. So it's free promotion for CDU and also for uh, our rising star scholar. Yeah, we'll keep a bit going. You will see that he's not happy with me. Then I say, he's supposed to be the writing star. I hope that he was science, right? Uh, but he's always a star, right? So uh, today I have too many science and nature papers, so okay. So anyway, suppose we have a three lecture at the uh, home of a very pleasant and crucial time. So uh, we will start from Professor Wang Jinghui. Okay. Uh, you can see it here from Peking University in 2001 and the PhD from University of Minnesota, USA in 2006. And he was uh, a, an assistant professor and then an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago from 2008 and to 2013. And then he became an associate professor at CTU in 2013 and advanced to full professor in 2018. And Professor Wang Jingwei's main research interest is on the statistics for machine learning and its broad application in biomedicine, engineering, finance, IT, and other data related areas. Okay, so we're going to have a warm welcome, Professor Wang, to give the first. Thank you very much for the nice reception, Professor Bond, and also uh, thank, uh, thank you all the members of Hong Kong IMS for the. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank, thank all the members of Hong Kong IMS for your kind support and the encouragement. Okay, it's truly a uh, great honor and a privilege to have a chance to stay in the academy here to. To, to, to share my recent uh, research. And my talk today is basically a more like a summary of what we have been doing in the past three years. So this is a joint effort with all my collaborators, including Andy and Shuffle from the US and also my former and current PhD students. Some of them have already started tenure track jobs in various places. So yeah, so let me now list. Yeah, okay, so, so, so my talk today basically is called Linear Factor Model. So, Linear Factor Model is not really a new topic, okay. In fact, it can be dated back to early 20th century. So, when, when researchers uh, try to use Linear Factor Model to qualify human beings to interest in hygiene. But recently, we, uh, it turns out that Linear Factor Model actually can, uh, is a very, very suitable to analyze the, the biotic and the multi-addict relational uh, data. 
and well, and in particular, this uh, entities in this relation data and this relational data can be embedded by uh, by the relation the relation data models in the low dimensional space, uh, so that well, the relations uh, among different entities can still be well kept in this low dimensional space. So examples of this type of relational data include. A, a, a customer's ratings on, on products, okay, and also the, the test taker's performance on, on exam products, and also the, the use of behavior, linking behaviors in social networks, and the many, many more problems. So I will start with a, a simple application uh, that's called the recommender system, okay. So the recommender system, well, basically uh, the data we have is more or less like this matrix, but, uh, but, um, uh, way uh, more uh, number of rows and way more number of columns. So here I just want to respond to my favorite show, Game of Thrones, uh, Game of Thrones. so I just manipulate a, a few customers. So here each row here is my is my customer. Okay, so those are kids from the house of stuff. And then it's column there, uh, etc. cetera, the movie. So then, well, we will have, we will have, like, for example, we will have five. Anyway, well, like five, there, basically, uh, well, the first customer really likes the movie Titanic, so he gets a rating five. Okay, so we have all these ratings in the matrix, but then well, we have a lot of question marks there. Okay, so then the job here is just to guess or just to predict uh, whether the customers will like the movie he hasn't seen yet, or we want to replace the question mark with some explicit rating. So then, based on rating, we can do the recommendation. So then, the, 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 the customer will like the system, and then well, yeah, so on so forth. Okay, so well, this recommend, uh, recommender system actually uh, get popular well, since uh, 2006 when this Netflix company initiated this so called million dollar competition. So, well, this company shared their own data sets and then there are roughly uh, 480,000 uh, customers and also about 18,000 movies and they in total that's about 100 million ratings. Okay, so then, well, then people you know, try to try to do the competition, try to predict the customers' ratings on the movie. Okay, so there are some structures, interesting structures in these data sets. One is that, well, uh, even though it looks like well, we have a lot of ratings, one in the unit, okay, but still, well, the duration of the ratings are very, very sparse, very, very sparse uh, in the matrix. Uh, roughly speaking, there are about 99% of the, the, the entries in the matrix, in that big matrix, are actually missing our question marks. So the job here is just to use about 1% of the ratings to predict the remaining 99% of the question marks. So that's one big challenge, one the structure. Another structure is so-called the cost of the issues. So just imagine you have a new customer coming in with a new product. So basically, you don't have any rating, okay, for the new customer or for the new new, new product. So then you, so that's for the cost of You have to, uh, we have to deal with that, okay, in the recommended system. Okay, so that's one application. That's a, another application is called Nellis data. So this picture shows a, a, a co-authored Nellis data, and the data actually comes from the, the authors of the, the journal articles from four leading uh, statistic journals. Okay, so then that amounts to about 3,000 papers and also uh, 3,600 authors. So then, well, basically, each author here is just a, a blue dot in the, in the picture, and then if there's a, there's a red uh, edge connecting two blue dots, that means these two guys, two authors, ever uh, collaborate in one paper. Okay, so that's a co authorship network. Okay, so then in, in, in this network, basically, they try to capture the somehow the, the, the collaboration relationship, okay, with, uh, between the authors. Okay, and then, well, this relationship can be directed or can be undirected. Okay, so in our project, we actually we, we work with the directed networks. Uh, okay, and then, well, in network data, actually, that uh, has been a widely observed structure uh, uh, that's called community. Uh, in the sense that, well, people sharing similar research interests that tend to work together. Okay, so then in that network, you may uh, locate some small subset of authors that can kind of work with each other. Okay, then also now there is also very, very sparse. Okay, and in, uh, in the sense that well, each also may collaborate with just a few uh, other authors. Okay, in, in this network. All right. So yeah. So now, well, this is what we uh, uh, we do. Okay, by using the data set model. So given that we have this dynamic relational data that can be uh, described by a matrix. Okay, so n rows and n columns. So in that matter system, this, uh, these uh, elements will be the user you get uh, the rating of user you get to the item I. 
Okay, and then in the direct network, this RUI element means uh, that the user you send the edge to you know, uh, our user I. It's maybe like a citation, okay, a reference link. Okay, and then if it's on the direct network, then it's just like two, two, uh, two way interactions. So like we, we could work together, like a tool thing, okay. So then, well, for all these kind of relational data, the uh, common assumption is that, well, this matrix is of low rank, okay. So in a sense that we usually assume that the rank of this rating matrix, so all these uh, relational data matrix, is small rank, okay, less than equal to a given number of k. And then with this assumption, the relational factor model basically assumes that, well, we can model the expectation of the, the ratings, or, or the data can be decomposed into one relational factor P times another relational factor uh, Q, so that the relational factor actually can be, uh, can be interpreted as a, some characteristic of the user U or characteristic of the user I. Okay, so that's, a, that's the, 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 basically the key skeleton of this uh, relational factor model, all right? So then, well, in, in, in this recommended system, we actually, well, uh, we actually did, uh, did a work, basically, we call this sort of smoothing recommended systems. I guess the, the catch is that, well, uh, the catch is the, uh, is this part, okay? Uh, given that we have a lot of meter ratings in, in, in the matrix, so basically we're going to replace that uh, with a, uh, well, we're going to replace this meter rating uh, ratings with a, like a weighted average of its friends, its neighbors, ratings on the similar items. So, so, so for in this work, basically, we somehow incorporate the idea of the, the data imputation in statistics and also the collaborative learning in, 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 in recommended systems. So, then, well, by doing that, well, actually, this method can enlarge the, the sample space, enlarge the number of the observations, so that, well, we can, we can improve the prediction accuracy and we can also tackle the, the cost by issues. So, uh, and then in this, uh, in this direct network uh, data set, we actually, uh, uh, we're actually going to do a direct community detection method, and we also, uh, based on, uh, also based on the different type of models, and then well, we, we just uh, assume that well, the, the large transformation of the probability of TIJ can be decomposed as a random factor model. And then based on that, we can write out the likelihood function, and then we can also uh, equip the likelihood function with a number of uh, penalty terms. Okay, so so the penalty terms actually inquire the the the, the nodes actually uh, somehow uh, close to each other. Okay, so then well, uh, in, in this uh, especially J one. Okay, so in this penalty J one, we actually again we actually incorporate the idea of k-means clustering. That's a very very classical. Uh, idea in statistics, the thing is clustering and also the also the, the network embedding. Okay, so we also, also incorporate these two ideas together and then try to do the direct network uh, uh, community detection. Okay, and then well, uh, again, well, we can achieve uh, good consistencies in terms of network estimations, also community detections, even when the network is very, very sparse, in the sense that the probability is actually upper bounded by this exponential order, which keeps us infinity. So this probably can be very, very small, okay? So the, these are some of the, 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 the uh, works. And then well, if we look at this cold section network again, so there were well, in this network, two nodes are connected if they ever uh, collaborate uh, in one paper. But well, well, we do have paper that have more than two authors, right? So then well, if we have paper more than two authors, then basically they will just check all the possible pairs, then just come, come, with, come up with different edge. But well, that may not be the, the, the most uh, appropriate way. Okay, so actually we can come up, we can represent everything in the so-called hypergraph networks, so that we have hyper edge. Hyper edge may have more than two relatives in one edge. Okay, that's called hypergraph. Okay, so here I just give some four examples of hypergraph. On the left, that's a very famous funnel, uh, funnel plan. Okay, that's a three years from hyper uh, hypergraph. So we have seven, edge, seven hyper edge here, and each hyper edge has three vertices, okay, on the left. And on the right, that's actually a, in the middle edge, okay, we just simply generate this, uh, this uh, hypergraph networks, that's a non-uniform hypergraph networks. So in this hypergraph networks, some edge has only, uh, some, uh, some edge has only two vertices, but uh, some edge, such as E5, has four, uh, four vertices. So then the cardinality of this edge is actually different. So it's for the non-uniform uh, hypergraph. Okay, so yeah, so now uh, mathematically we can denote you know, hypergraph with uh, a, a node set V and also the hyper edge set E. So then a hyper edge here is nothing but simply a non-empty subset of the, of the vertices. Okay, 
So then we call this hypergraph the uniform hypergraph with all the hyperlinks. Have exactly the same number of vertices. Okay, so then what well, if it's not uniform if the hyperlinks dynamic can vary from one to another? So we may have to have it. Have it with two vertices, you might have it with 20 vertices. Okay, so, so that's a non uniform hyperlinks. Okay, so then, well, in, 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 in literature, people usually uh, uh, do uh, somehow convert a non uniform hypergraph uh, to the uniform hypergraph or even a graph network. Okay, so such as they do the projection approach, so they convert the uh, non uniform hypergraph into a graph network. Basically, they just see what well, each pair is in the same type of edge, then they will connect in the convert in the projected network. So, so then they can convert into a binary network, or they can uh, project it into a weighted graph. The weighted graph, the weight actually uh, depends on how many times these two guys work together. Okay, in the same in the hyper edge, you just count the number of hyper edge where these two uh, appear in the same, uh, uh, how many times they appear together. Okay. So then another pro another um, uh, approach is called the decomposition approach. The composition approach is that well, we try to decompose the non-uniform hypergraph into a fraction of uniform hypergraphs. Such as for this very uh, simple toy hypergraph, we decompose it into a two uniform hypergraph on the left, three, three uniform hypergraph in the middle, and also four uniform hypergraphs on the on the right. Okay, if we have more, then you keep on going. Okay, it's just then eventually we end with a fraction of uniform hypergraphs. Uh, then, well, you can you can work on each of the units of the graph, and then uh, you may take a union, you take a section, whatever, and then you will uh, you can you can you can have some inference result for the non-uniform graph. But well, then if we do that, basically you can imagine that well, if we are working in the in the area that we have a long list of causes, then probably we are looking at an extraction of a large number of uniform hypergraphs. Okay, then computationally it takes a lot of uh, uh, expenses. Okay. So this is our proposal. So our proposal actually consists of two simple steps. Okay, the first step is optimization step, and then the second step is the embedding step, just like what we do uh, for the network data. So the optimization step is a, is a very simple uh, step. Basically, we just have, well, uh, so first we, we assume that the largest hyperedge in the non-uniform hypergraph is of cardinality n, so we call this range. So then we just check all other hyperedge. If the hyper edge have an edge is less than n, we just simply add multiple vertices. Uh, actually, the same vertices, multiple times. Okay, and we call these additional vertices a, a, a ghost uh, vertex. Okay, it has no meaning, but basically just like a more or less like a stopping rule or a stopping node. Okay, so then, well, so this optimization step actually is very, very uh, nice in the sense that, well, at the end of the day, we are not looking at a non uniform hypergraph anymore. We actually have a uniform hypergraph with all the n. And then also for each of the we just see, okay, these bunch of guys are the, my ghost vertices, I can throw that away. So they are have exactly the, the hyperhead in the original hypergraph. Okay, and then, well, uh, after we get this uniform hypergraph, we can do it in that. Okay, so yeah, so here's, here's the idea. So given that we have this very, uh, this toy uh, hyperglass, so for example, we have this E4, for example, we have two vertices, then, well, the range here in this uh, single hyperglass is four, okay, the largest, the, the largest hyperglass is has four vertices. So then for this E4, we're going to add two times of V6, I think V6, uh, okay, in, in that. So then, well, now my E4 has four vertices, but two of them are actually the result vertices. So then on the right, we actually have a uniform hypergraph now, okay, but actually it's not exactly the uniform hypergraph, it's actually, we call it the uniform market hypergraph, in the sense that, well, some vertices actually appear multiple times, okay, it's not like every vertex can appear only one time, okay, I do have one vertex, the those vertex that can appear multiple times, so it's called a market hypergraph. Okay, and then, well, then with, with this uniform market hypergraph, so we can, I, I can, become, I can re represent this uh, uniform hyper graph with the tensor, okay? So then, well, I have an order tensor, and then, well, the each element equals to all zero, depending on what I do, have an extra edge in the, in the hyper graph. And then, well, we, we just do a, a logistic transformation, but this is a modified logistic transformation to incorporate the sparsity in this hyper graph network, okay? And then, well, then we, uh, then we, 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 then we, uh, that's the first step, okay, that's the optimization step. And then the second step is just try to embed these uniform multi-hyper graphs 
while you while I just have like what we do. But now well, we are we have not a matrix, we actually have a uh, okay, but uh, well, we can just decompose the tensor uh, very easily. Okay, so here we just we just use a a a, a type of uh, uh, decomposition here. Okay, we decompose this n modal tensor uh, into this uh, identity tensor multiplied by alpha one, alpha i one, alpha alpha i n. So each alpha i here is just an r dimensional vector corresponding to node i in this invariant space. Okay. But just one catch is that well, remember we do have this additional uh, ghost work the uh, n plus one uh, numbers. Okay, so for that one we don't really need to embed it. We just simply set the embedding vector of the ghost vector, um, sorry, ghost node to be one, 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 one. Okay, so, so we don't really need to sacrifice our computing power to, to estimate the, the embedding vector for that one. And then uh, this uh, CP, uh, this type of decomposition, uh, type like uh, decomposition, actually has the equivalent of CP decomposition form. Okay, so with this form, we actually can see that well, uh, this data actually has a symmetric ring of R. Okay, then we can decompose them into into the summation of uh, these red one uh, uh, tensors, the sum of red one tensors. All right, so then, well, based on all these two steps and the remaining part, I think are pretty standard. So well, we do have this. Uh, Latent factor model there, so we can write out the likelihood function for this high, uh, multi, uh, uh, uniform uh, multi, uh, uniform multi hypergraphs. Okay, so we can we can uh, uh, associate this likelihood with a with a, a, a community hardening uh, penalties, and then we can also show some uh, statistical guarantee that well, eventually we do uh, recover the true communities with a with a high probability or the, the uh, of these with, uh, the error between the true community and estimate communities actually come much to zero with a very fast order uh, order of uh, rate of convergence. And then uh, one one catch is that well uh, these uh, the these results are held as long as the sparsity in the hyper networks uh, is larger than this a raised to one minus m times log n. So that's pretty abstract, but I guess well the idea is that as long as uh, in these hyper hyper uh, graph networks, uh, it, uh, as long as the average uh, node degree is log n, so we're able to recover the community. So in a sense, if we are looking at a, a hyper graph network with ten thousand uh, nodes, so as long as the average node degree is four, okay, so well, we're we're able to recover the community. So so that that's a pretty uh, pretty uh, a promising uh, encouraging results. Okay, so then we actually apply these results uh, to a number of uh, real data sets. Here I just show two. So uh, I thought I would probably explain the first one. So the, uh, the first network is actually uh, it's about some medical terms. Okay, so the medical terms is about two different diseases. Okay, C04 and C10. And then we, uh, there are a total of 318 terms. And then we just simply check, well, uh, we have a number of articles. And we, we see if the articles contain these two terms, then well, this, uh, or if these articles contain multiple terms, then that's a hyper edge. Okay. So then in this real data set, we have a hyper network with uh, 318 uh, nodes, and we have a total of a little over a thousand hyper edge. That means we have a, a little over a thousand medical research articles. Okay, so so we have a set in the real data set that's pretty uh, similar. Okay, I'll probably skip that. And then, well, just to show you the result, we compare our methods. Uh, we call these hypergraph embedding models against some other uh, very state of the art uh, methods for the hypergraph networks. So, uh, so then we can see that our methods on the first column they actually produce a much smaller uh, heavy error than the competitors. So, in addition to the better uh, uh, this uh, community detection accuracy, we also this embedding model also provides a very very nice visualization of the of the nodes. Okay, that is shown on this left um, the right panels. So we can see that well, after we embed the nodes uh, into this three dimensional uh, embedding space, we actually can see that well, the nodes actually are well separated. Okay, into these two two classes. Okay, C zero four and C zero ten on the left, and also. Uh, similar for the for the for the uh, second example. Okay, so these are a few messages I hope I can I can convey here. So first, latent factor model, even though it's very very classical, but it's still uh, well finds the applications, finds the powers in the uh, these a number of modern applications. Okay, and then while well, latent factor models actually or the embedding models in general actually provide a very nice tool for improving prediction accuracy and also model interpretability. Okay, such as the visualization which you can do for the nodes. 
And uh, well, that, that, that class that I've been thinking, I've been thinking for, for quite some years. So for these cancer for matrix, other than low rank, well, maybe other structures, yeah, we're still trying to figure that out. So, okay, we do have some ongoing, uh, ongoing works, uh, including dynamic networks and also some other, uh, other things. So I guess that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, now for the Q&A section. I brought my two thoughts. In face conservation, patiently, we do have latent heat. So okay. we know the word latent based on latent heat, but now your latent factor mm -hmm. uh, still different. So maybe you can see some physical explanation. What do you mean in, uh, in your model? Latent, why do you need a latent factor? Okay, you know, thank you for the question. So, well, I think my understanding of this latent factor model or latent is something which is here on screen, but it's there. So just like the inheritance score, like what, what the example I gave in the first slide, like the inheritance score, it's there, but we cannot measure it. Okay, so that's why we, we, well, we try to use some tools to measure it, but then translate it into this latent inheritance score. So similarly for the, for the recommender system. So recommender system, we try to use latent factors, uh, latent factors try to capture the user preference, such as I want to see action movies, or maybe some other movies. Or any the latent factors try to capture the movie's uh, uh, characteristics. So this movie is about action, but there are a few features, a few superstars there. So these are uh, things that we don't know why this guy likes that movie. So then we try to use latent factor model to somehow capture his uh, the user preferences and also the movie's characteristics and try to match these things. So it sounds like that's there, so and that's my understanding. In the data era, uh -huh. maybe you find a lot of applications. Is it available? Uh, <laughs> yeah. One question from one. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a uh, single question. So I noticed uh, you mentioned those hyper apps, right? So in your new algorithm, basically, you just find the longest uh, hyper-edge, uh, right? Then you add those so-called ghost uh, vertices to others, to uh, such that mathematically they have the same length, right? So how about in such a circumstance? So only a few hyper-edge, they are really, really long. So most of them just uh, add like two vertices, three vertices, very short. So, so, uh, so uh, how the performance of your algorithm compared with existing one? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's a very, that's a very sharp question. Okay, very sharp in the sense that while well, in application, that's exactly the case. Okay, we do have a lot of hyper edge, which is of small cardinality, but usually there are a few with uh, a, a large cardinality. So in reality, in practice, when we deal with such a data set, Usually, we will just convert that, say, like 200 way interactions into small ones. Unfortunately, we have to so we we'll have to somehow balance the, the accuracy and also the, the computing efficiency. So, so for for your specific for your question, yeah, we will do that. Okay, we will not sacrifice the computational efficiency for only a few very long uh, hyper edge. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, I'm not even clear, right? 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 I'm not what is the current state of art with this very little model that we're using right now? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, could you? Uh, yeah. I, I, I got a question. So, uh, yeah, again, okay, it's a very good question. Well, uh, in a sense, well, the latent factor model actually has a different name in deep learning community called embedding. Okay, so, so but, there, but there, well, basically, the, in addition to this network, they actually have a number of co-variants of the node. And the node covariance. 
So then what they, what they will do is that well, they, they will first convert each node into so for one whole encoding in addition to the node covariance. So they have a long input. So then from there, they're going to build some network, uh, deep learning, uh, deep neural network structures and then they will, they will, uh, they are, they are such things. But, but then I think well, the, the catch here is that well, uh, first we do need a node covariance. So in order to start a, a neural network models, okay. So that's one. And the second thing is that well, even uh, actually for the recommended system, uh, even we have the node covariance, what we try to do is that we still try to combine the, the deep learning models with the, the late, uh, collaborative filters. Actually, that, uh, so now they have a, a name for that. It's called a two power model. Okay, they have one power for the user, another power for the, for the items, but each power is a deep learning model. And then the, the, at the end of the day, they actually use a collaborative filtering to combine these two powers. So, yeah, so I think what this is people are doing now is to try to uh, incorporate these deep learning structures with statistic structures or, or, or some structures in the domain of it. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, so that, that's what we. But I, I wonder, so for your second message here, so you think that uh, you can have uh, improved the model interpretability, uh -huh. but then is it easy to interpret the rotation factors because you don't impose anything there? Uh, you're right. Uh, okay. In, uh, frankly, it's actually very difficult to interpret the latent factor, the exact meaning of latent factor. So here, by interpretability, what I try to say is actually some kind of visualization tool. So we actually can, in this low dimensional space, and we can somehow somehow separate the data points. And if we really want to interpret data factors, then I don't know. Then probably we need to borrow stress from domain experts, such as the movies, movie experts, to to, to try to somehow explain the low dimensional uh, vectors of the, the movies. That Any other questions? This side? Oh, where's the green one? Okay. How about students? Students in the back? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, another one question is that uh, we do have some latent factor, and uh, in practice, we do have some like um, uh, features that we can observe. That, so it's like two components, one is latent, you cannot see, another one is visible, then you can observe it. Then the question is about combining those two components data to come to the side of the information. Uh, okay, so by the observable feature, you mean just a node covariance, for example, or user covariance, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so that's a similar question to, to uh, earlier question. So what used to be, uh, if we put that in a deep learning framework, so we will first uh, convert the user in a one hole encoding, like a real one thing, and then in addition, we will we'll, uh, attach the node features to these zero one vectors, so we have a longer features, and then I use that as an input, and then put that in, in the deep learning models, and fully connected or whatsoever, and then, yeah, so that, that's one thing we can do, okay. And well, yeah, there, so there are other things well, we might do, okay, by using some, some structures in the features, so that, uh, we have been doing that with some of the early ones. So, yeah. All right. Okay. We don't have questions online. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, this was a free talk. You have a perfect timing. So, thank you very much. So, let's give a warm applause to Professor Wong. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will introduce you to the next. Speaker, uh, this is Professor Pierre Wallen. Uh, he received his PhD in 2008 from University of Paris, and and the uh, April Normal Superior in France. And later he worked as an instructor and PIRE fellow. Uh, I think PIRE represents the common field of international research and education, a uh, very prestigious fellow at the uh, Polish Institute of Mathematics Science in New York University, USA, uh, from 2008 to 2011. And then he uh, uh, worked as an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics in ETH 
through week one from 2011 to 2017. And from 2017, he became an associate professor in CTU. Okay. And Professor uh, Lawrence's research is focused on the uh, probability theory and the uh, stochastic process uh, in connection with crossing originating from the statistics uh, me mechanics. And he's particularly interested in the lattice models, such as, uh, I guess, it's icing models, okay, uh, of the uh, ferromagnetism, uh, the balloonian, percolation, uh, uh, and other collections, and as well as the forest bio process. So this is a, a talk. So let's uh, all welcome Professor Bowen. Okay, so uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for this very kind uh, introduction. It is really my, my great pleasure to be, uh, to be here. And uh, I was uh, very uh, honored to be, uh, to be selected as, uh, as one of these uh, three uh, lectures. And I think this is a very uh, fantastic opportunity uh, to showcase my, uh, my recent uh, work. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Wong and all the uh, uh, senior fellows of the IAS and uh, members of the committee for, for selecting me. That was really my, uh, my great work. Okay, so uh, today I decided to, to present a stochastic process coming from statistical physics uh, on which I have been working uh, yes, uh, in the last uh, roughly uh, ten, uh, 10 years. Uh, and here I will see my, my collaborators in this uh, series of uh, work. Uh, so, uh, so, Robert Mendel from uh, Amsterdam, David Ortiz, and White Pitman. Uh, and uh, more particularly, I will, uh, I will discuss four fire processes and the link uh, between this, uh, these processes and uh, the phenomenon uh, introduced in statistical physics, which is called uh, the self organized uh, totality uh, phenomenon. Okay, so uh, well, uh, here this uh, stochastic process, this spectral stochastic process. Is named uh, for a spiral for uh, historical reasons. It was introduced uh, as such by uh, two physicists, Rostov and Schwager, in uh, 1992. But uh, I think uh, such processes of uh, activated, uh, activated media are actually ubiquitous in statistical uh, uh, physics. And uh, you could find exactly the, the same question about epidemics spreading in the population, for example, or uh, a political opinion uh, spreading among, uh, among people. And uh, we will consider a very simplified uh, version of such a process, which was one introduced by both of the fathers. We still at the same time simple enough so that we can uh, say, uh, we can still say something about this, uh, this uh, process uh, mathematically. And on the other hand, uh, so that it, uh, it captures really the, the mechanism in such uh, processes. Uh, and we will be able to, to derive from a uh, qualitative quantity of the process. Okay, so I'll define in the, in the following way. So we start on a, on a two-dimensional grid, so for example, the, the square grid, which is shown uh, here. And on this, uh, on this square grid, uh, we, we have uh, we have axes, and these axes become occupied independently at some given point, for the right, uh, right one. Which means that trees uh, appear uh, on the on the lattice on the grid uh, independently at some uh, at some uh, fixed uh, speed. Okay. So if there was only this mechanism, this would be uh, not too complicated to, to analyze. But we have the mechanism. So when we generate a uh, final final process, we have the mechanism that the lattice is also fixed by uh, by lattice. So we have some other ignition process with some uh, red zeta. Uh, which is uh, which is uh, positive, 
and uh, independence of the, of the process of growth. Okay, and when, uh, when uh, the tree of the vertex is hit by, uh, by lightning, this vertex burns, and it means that it becomes uh, vacant at least sometime you see. Uh, together with this uh, all uh, connected components, which is shown right there. And so all the development is connected to this, uh, to this vertex hit by, uh, by lightning, uh, become uh, become vacant, uh, they, they burn, and so they are lost. Uh, in, uh, in and you can see immediately on, on this picture that when such uh, connected component of the trees burns, it will, uh, it will create a lasting uh, scar on, on the lattice, which will prevent uh, new connections of uh, trees from, uh, from occurring uh, later in the, in the evolution of the process. Okay, and such processes are, are not always difficult to, to study in, uh, in quality theory uh, because of the existence of uh, competing effects in the sense that the more trees are in the forest, uh, the more connected the forest is, but the more connected uh, the forest is, the easier it is for fires to spread and so to disconnect uh, the forest for, for later. Okay? And so, uh, because of these competing effects, uh, all the, the sound output from the type to soil mechanics uh, cannot be uh, cannot be used. Okay, so here I represented uh, the final configuration that we obtained with uh, a rate uh, zeta equal to zero point zero one. And uh, on this uh, picture, which I find uh, seems to me it's quite fascinating, I represented uh, the various connected components that uh, that does. So this way, it's positive, uh, infinity, all that is seen. So here is the final configuration I find equal to infinity. Infinity, all that is uh, are done, but they, they, don't, they can run at very uh, different times. Okay, and the various shades of blue in this uh, picture uh, show the various times at which uh, the vertices trees are done. Uh, very light uh, blue corresponds to a uh, late time, and uh, very dark blue, like uh, here, there is more connected component, which is almost black. Uh, corresponds to, uh, to early time. Again, we would like to, to say something about such, uh, such a picture because it's very, uh, it looks very messy and we would like to, to, uh, to understand uh, the structure of such, uh, such a picture. Okay, something I should, uh, I should have mentioned is that we are interested in, uh, in the behavior of this uh, process as we take the rate down to zero. This is uh, the interesting, uh, the interesting behavior. And this is when the, the, the phenomenon of uh, self-organized criticality is uh, shown. Okay, and uh, there is a whole part of priority uh, theory which is devoted to, uh, to studying such uh, special uh, random processes, which is called the uh, uh, Tarpa electron uh, theory. And uh, more precisely, we will uh, discuss a model which is called the Danuri type Tarpa electron, which was introduced by Goldberg uh, and Hanassi in uh, 1957, and it's defined in the following way, so it will be reminiscent of, uh, of the, the quiet process that I just uh, discussed. So we pick some parameter p between uh, q and 1, and uh, for each vertex we say that we declare that it's uh, occupied with priority p and vacant with priority 1 minus p independently of the, uh, of the other vertex. So we, we just sort uh, various uh, coins for each, uh, each vertex and we find it to be occupied with priority P, so containing the tree, for example, and uh, they can uh, they can do the ones. Okay, and so we if we uh, if we represent occupied vertices in black and they can just be white, we will say in this way a random coloring of the of the square width. And then I'm specifically interested in the uh, in the connectivity uh, properties of this uh, random uh, coloring. So what can we say about the, the connected components of black types or of white uh, white Okay, and uh, one important question in particular is whether there exists uh, an infinite connected component of black types or not, because such an infinite connected component of black types will allow information to spread uh, very fast. Well, if we only have a small finite connected component, it means that information or fire will, uh, will stay localized, it will only, uh, it will only spread to within the finite. Okay, so this, uh, this model is uh, very useful to, to study forest fire processes. So we use, uh, use extensively tools uh, coming from uh, from the uh, theory. 
which is now very well understood due, due to uh, the series of work by uh, Robert Francis and Bernard around uh, 1991, 99, and 2001. And here in this particular case, we obtain random traits uh, which, which are related to a, to a now uh, well known stochastic process in the priority theory, which is called the Schrammerger revolution process. Uh, with the specific parameter of kappa equal to 6, which corresponds to a Bernoulli interpolation. So the SME process is one parameter family of processes, and the particular value kappa equal to 6 uh, describes the typical regime of, uh, of interpolation. So this I don't have time to explain, but then this, let me just mention that it, it has already been observed by physicists uh, earlier that interfaces created by uh, diffusing particles. Uh, are uh, approximately uh, factor interfaces with the dimension uh, which turns out to be uh, uh, very close to uh, seven quarters. So it has been observed uh, experimentally and uh, numerically. And uh, a different quarter, it is by no means uh, a coincidence, it's actually the dimension of interfaces in, uh, in uh, Bernoulli interpolation as typically. Uh, so it's quite a striking uh, observation. And uh, around 10 years ago, I was able to, to, uh, to give a, a precise uh, mathematical uh, statement along these lines, simplified uh, model. Now we consider uh, n particles starting from a given vertex on, uh, on the grid. We let them uh, diffuse independently, so perform what we call independent quantum groups on the, on the lattice. Uh, then, uh, as the number of particles n tends to infinity, and if you take the, the time proportional to, to n, uh, we observe a macroscopic boundary that looks like uh, SME with parameter in the, in the n tends to infinity uh, limit. Okay, so, this is uh, another instance of uh, uh, self organized physicality, which I, 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 I particularly uh, like. And uh, wait, uh, let me go back now to, to forest purposes. So, we, we've seen that. Uh, Natural to introduce this uh, particular physical time uh, TC defined by this, uh, this relation. And I said that before time uh, TC, we are still in the third physical regime, so we only observe uh, tiny connected components. And so in this regime, uh, fires will not be able to, to spread very far, they will stay localized. And if you take the rate uh, zeta uh, to zero, the rate of uh, diffusion, uh, you will actually uh, not. Uh, so the, the fires will, uh, will disappear in the, the limit. So you can use zeta smaller and smaller. Uh, so this is actually uh, not too difficult to, to prove. Uh, an important question is whether what happens at and after the, the physical time uh, TC. So can you get a qualitative description of the process around the physical time TC? Uh, what can we say about the, the polarity that? Uh, Given vertex, for example, the origin of the square grid burns before time t. So, does it converge to a so fixed MET larger than TT? Does it still converge to zero? Does it converge to one? Does it converge to some number between zero and one? So, it's still, uh, so it's still uh, an open question, actually. And uh, suppose now that we allow recovery, so we allow uh, burn that T to be occupied later at the time rate one. And what can we say about the equilibrium distribution? So if you, if you wait for an infinite amount of time, mm -hmm. and uh, the, at which speed uh, does the process converge to this uh, equilibrium uh, distribution? Okay, and this is a typical example of a non monotone process, so like this competing effect that I mentioned before. And uh, because of this, of this uh, uh, very little was, was known before about series of, uh, of and that's it. Actually, uh, many questions uh, still, uh, still remain uh, open. Okay, so let me uh, mention briefly uh, some of the results we, we obtained, which were not predicted in, uh, in the literature before. So first, we pointed out the existence of a sequence of exceptional scales, which are a function of the rate, uh, of the rate zeta. And we, we showed that uh, we observe two uh, very different behavior according to, uh, so if we run the, the process in a finite box with a silence, which is a given function m of uh, the rate uh, zeta, and we observe two very different behavior according to whether the, the silence of the box is of order mp of zeta for something, so this m order of one 
of this exceptional space, or uh, if it's between two consecutive exceptional space, but far away from uh, from God. Okay, so in particular, the, the polarity that the even the apex burst before time t is rounded away from zero as zeta tends to zero in the, in the first case, shown in uh, red, where in the second case it tends to, uh, to zero as zeta tends to, uh, to zero. Okay, so predictively, uh, these two uh, cases are very different. And uh, I like this result because it highlights the, the non-monotone nature of the forest fires in the sense that uh, if you look at this probability and we increase the size of the, of the, of the box, uh, this probability is uh, bounded away from zero here, and then it's, it tends to zero, then it's again bounded away from zero, it tends to zero, and so, so you have uh, an oscillating behavior which is quite uh, quite uh, uh, peculiar. Okay, and each of these exceptional states follows the power law in uh, one over zeta, with an explicit uh, sequence of experience which is strictly increasing and converges to this uh, exotic value uh, 48 over uh, 50. And we also uh, show together with white Islam that uh, what we call identical uh, avalanches uh, arise. That if we, uh, if we look at the given vertex on the, on the grid and look at the, uh, the connected components running around it, uh, the number of such uh, connected components running around it uh, tends to infinity as zeta tends to zero, but there is no theory like log log of one over zeta, and we are even able to compute uh, the explicit constant. Uh, and I will uh, conclude very soon. Let me just mention that uh, in order to, uh, to understand the, the geophysical uh, behavior of forest fire processes, we have to understand uh, the, the configuration of the forest uh, right before time uh, FC. And we have to understand which parts of the lattice have been destroyed, have already been destroyed by fires at this, uh, at this time. And so this is an understanding that we, we have to develop in our, uh, in our work, and which I think uh, could be useful in many other uh, situations. So this is the type of kind of environment that we have to uh, to learn. Okay, so thank you again for your your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. 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 Your model is very similar to phase transformation. You create and grow. All right. That's a very good question, and uh, there should be, uh, there should be uh, indeed uh, uh, additional features that we could start to introduce into this model. So wind is one, and also uh, sparks, the fact that fires are able to spread within some distance. Uh, this we haven't thought so much about. Uh, so it's a simplified model. Also, uh, we will assume that fires uh, spread uh, instantaneously. Which makes sense because there is a separation of time scale between the, the work process and the, 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 the speed at which fires are spread. But this is also uh, something that needs to be uh, that needs to be uh, understood in, in the eye. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Thank you very much. You mentioned the uh, kind of universal spectral structures of space. Yes. So what about the other? Uh, so in this case, it's uh, uh, it's, it's quite uh, remarkable. So it's the work of uh, Lovelace and Bernard uh, and Smirnov that there is a one parameter family of uh, of uh, random curves which are called the uh, Schrödinger evolution with parameter kappa. With kappa is a parameter which uh, which is positive and which describes a wide vari variety of uh, of, uh, of stochastic processes in the continuum limit. So in particular, the Z model of Theron's magnetism, which is the number two, which corresponds to the value kappa equals to three. Uh, it arises uh, very naturally in the version C3 also. Uh, it arises with a model which is called self avoiding on the wall, uh, also the loop erase on the wall, and many, uh, many different. So it's a, uh, there is a, sorry, uh, we call it a meta theorem due to a dash one. 
I will prove that uh, if there is some, uh, if the model satisfies some performance invariance, it is with the property to the multi-year limit, together with some uh, what we call domain Markov properties. So I don't know how to explain it, but the fact that you can explore in some sense the configuration and, uh, and only keep the information along the boundary. Uh, if you have this, this properties, uh, then uh, you should uh, you should observe Schramm uh, Schramm evaluation. But it's really a very beautiful part. Thank you. And then you can see the, that there are actually uh, two field medallions from the other board from this board. Thank you. Well, I wonder if you can use your model to predict the COVID nineteen you know, pandemic. Yeah. Can you? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. So we are well, very far from uh, from uh, modeling. So I'm not sure it's uh, it would be uh, it would be very useful in a real life situation. Except that we're trying to uh, to uh, predict and to capture some of the qualitative behavior of such uh, such processes. And so it, in that sense, it might be useful in this for for epidemiology. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, yes. So, I understand your model is basically into into you can consider the number of participants, right? So, is there any similar uh, model or analysis available on a compact manifold, for example, unit here? Something like that. It's a good question. So. So on the one hand, these are really uh, two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional process. So we're really using heavily the fact that we are in two dimensions, which is natural for for S files to calculate uh, in two dimensions. But uh, uh, for in other situations, three dimension like would make more sense. And in this case, uh, we have two uh, uh, we have really two uh, two, uh, two few tools at our disposal to to uh, analyze uh, such processes. So the, the data interpolation process itself is very poorly understood at the moment in three dimensions. So it's well understood in 2D, it's well understood in high dimension when you have enough degrees of freedom, but in low dimension, larger than two is not very well understood. On the other hand, uh, if you take uh, any other grid or uh, a continuum setting or a two dimensional manifold, I would expect similar, uh, similar behavior to, to arise. Even though maybe mathematically you are not able to prove it really uh, formally. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Student or postcard? Well, if some postcard ask questions, you can reach your salary. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I wait to see my diary? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Well, actually, uh, well, maybe I just borrowed uh, from Jacob's uh, question. So, if I source a uh, fire, so uh, this model can be used in other other applications. Yes. Yeah, so, thank you for uh, for your question. Um, so I think that there's been indeed widely used in, uh, in applications. So I'm not very familiar with uh, with those, but uh, clearly in the context of uh, epidemics, or uh, uh, I think people are also interested in how, uh, for example, the opinion spread in the population. So you know, you convince your neighbor, and then the neighbor convince someone else, and, uh, or in a in some one of graph uh, setting. So these are, uh, I'm not very uh, familiar, but I, I know there is an extensive literature in, uh, in statistics where uh, it is devoted to such uh, models. And actually, it was also a to to uh, to uh, to visit. Uh, on the other hand, some of the very basic questions that mathematically are still not answered. They are not really well understood also from the typical point of view. For example, this is a typical evidence is that we not there. They were not considered. We don't understand at all what the equilibrium distribution is, for example, which is, I think, the main open question. So we don't know uh, what the limiting density of species is, for example, which is uh, 
So you the, the energy the, is controlled so we have we have some kind of uniform bound for the for the uh, for the point, for example, low lift score and also low to the gun. Okay. And we also have some kind of regularity for the velocity. Whenever we talk about the velocity, it will tell you narrative, just means that we have some gradient estimate. Okay. So for this, for this kind of problem, so we, we, whenever we consider the convergence of weight energy, so we need to you know, pay attention to the you know, linearity. Okay. So if, 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 we, if we consider the, our equations, right, we only have three times, for example, rho u, which is a momentum which is nonlinear in terms of rho and u. And also rho u squared, rho u squared, this is related to the kinetic energy. And also another one is the rho to the gamma, uh, which is the pressure. All those, all, uh, all those terms are nonlinear, so we need to consider the convergence okay, in terms of weak uh, weak conversion. Okay. So for this kind of for this kind of uh, nonlinearity, we have the we have trouble for the, the for the uh, uh, for the nonlinear term rho u squared and rho to the gamma. For the rho u squared, if we want to the, if we want to get a convergence under the okay, under the weak, uh, weak convergence, we need to care about the two issues. One is the one is the concentration, okay. and the other one is the oscillation. Because for the rho u squared, because you have some kind of regularity, which means we have some kind of um, uh, information on the gradient. Okay, so we have some kind of uh, we, have, we have some good control on the oscillation. Uh, if you use um, the numerical velocity, so the, the only issue for the low use word, which is kinetic energy, we only need to care about the concentration, the possible concentration. But for the low uh, low to the gamma, the pressure, that because we don't have any uh, information on the gradient, so we need to pay attention to okay the both okay, concentration and the oscillation phenomenon. Okay. So in order to consider this problem, to overcome this kind of problem, we need to use uh, some kind of good information about the function yourself. The, fun the function, root of gamma, is a convergence function for gamma bigger than one, and the density is a, non uh, uh, is a positive, fun uh, pot 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 positive function. Okay. So this is uh, this uh, so this is the framework for us to handle 
just no linear time in the framework of weak conversions. Okay. So if we wanted to consider a little bit more, okay, okay, about the phenomena related to the weak conversions, okay, for example, if we consider to, uh, or if we wanted to consider the concentration or the oscillation, we, we take it then, then we take it to pressure as, a, as an example. So for, for example, because we we only have the okay, uh, the, okay L1 estimate of uh, root of the gamma, okay. So L1 estimate only ensures convergence to root of the gamma in the sense of the merger. So we, we don't know whether the limit of this uh, function or uh, function or not. Okay, if we if we have if we have some kind of a higher integrability of the pressure, then we can ensure ensure okay, the limit of the kind of limit of the pressure is indeed a function, not just a measure. So see, in this kind of situation, so the concentration may happen. The concentration may happen. Okay. Okay. If you even if we don't have a concentration, that, that means that we have the limit of the root of the gamma is just a function. Okay, we we'll, we still need to make sure okay the function is also takes the um, takes the form of uh, takes the form of root of the gamma. Okay, so we need to identify what's the what's the exact form of the limit function. Okay. Okay, so let us consider some uh, some examples okay, for the possible concentration and the oscillation. So for example, if we consider the oscillation, so very good uh, very good example for the. Uh, Possible constant on automation is the trigonometry function. So we consider the trigonometry function with the period of um, okay, with the period of uh, uh, two pi over n. So the period is smaller and smaller when the integer n is larger and larger. Okay, so that means that the value of the function takes from negative one to the one very fast. Okay, so the so the to the okay, to the period of the function is very small, is very small. Okay. So in, in some sense, okay, in our infinite sense, okay, the function will convert it to a constant, okay, over a okay, over a period, okay, from zero to pi. Okay, but that, okay, if we consider the square, because the the square, the square of the function is very okay, typical uh, no linear time, the quadratic form. Okay, so we consider the square of the function, the the, the square of the function will convert it to a, another uh, another constant beta. Okay, but the beta. Okay, the beta is the usually is bigger than or equal to alpha square. Okay, so there is no relationship between the between the square of the limit and the limit of the square. Okay, so in, in this kind of setting, we need to use some kind of uh, okay, uh, more advanced uh, technology uh, to help us uh, okay, to get it uh, to get it uh, uh, to get, or, uh, get get rid of the oscillation, the possible oscillation. For example. As I, as I explained in the earlier, we can use the convergence, okay, the convergence of the function. And we also can use the Young merger because the Young merger is very good too for us to, to, to control the oscillation of the, of the function. Okay? And also we can use the con converted compactness. For example, we have more information on the gradient, and then we have some kind of good, good information on the function itself. Okay? And also, if we, want, if we want to consider another issue relating to the relating to the concentration, the possible concentration, one good example is the Hayden okay. So I didn't use the temperature, but the Hayden I think all of you already know very well about the graph of the Hayden So the Hayden candle takes the form like this one. Okay. So the Hayden candle has a very good property. The triple mark is always black for all okay, for all time t. Okay. But uh, but keep in mind when t is approaching to zero and when x is not is not equal to zero, okay, so the function takes the value to the zero. But when t is approaching to zero, then the limit of the function, the limit, the limit of a uh, hidden candle actually is not a function in, in the classical sense. Okay, so the the function or the hidden candle will come will convert to a third function. Okay, in the in the distribution sense. So the that means that when t is approaching the zero, the total mass will be constituted at a single point. At that point, the, 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 the point has, uh, has zero dimension. Okay, so, so this means that this, okay, the energy or the mass will be concentrated on a very small, okay, very small region with very small measure. So this is the so called the concentration. So the two phenomena are very, okay, are very bad okay, in, in the consideration of weight conversions. So if we want to pass to the limit, okay, for the for the weak solutions, we need to okay, take care of uh, just two phenomena. Okay. okay, so so if we return back to, the, to our uh, consideration of one, okay, uh, 
and then and or we can say okay the the tonight the first of tonight of the concentration step is uh is a displaced uh and and the prison function is restricted to the gamma. When gamma is larger, the the tonight is it's more it's smaller. And uh, also, if we want to consider the problems in terms of the regularity of the world, okay, that means that if we impose, okay, if we if we improve a little bit of the regularity of the velocity, and then we also have some kind of uh, good distribution about it, uh, about it, the possible concentration, uh, what possible, okay, um, uh, also dimension of the of the concentration. Okay, so we have the hyperbolic house of dimension, and we also have the the exact value of the cost of inertia of the step. And uh, the, uh, the out, on the outside of the concentration, we have a higher in the variability of the, of the pressure, which is uh, we take it the value of Q. Q is typically bigger than the gamma. And uh, on the other side of, on the, side of the concentration, the, the weak dimension is actually the strong dimension. Okay. So this is the um, okay, so this is the uh, not of the up and up for, for this kind of structure. And also, if we wanted to consider more, so we have some other uh, open approaches relating to this, uh, this kind of uh, subject. Which, uh, the first one is the global time existence, because we only uh, we only consider the we only consider the case when when the concentration is very small, and then we have some condition on the uh, on the velocity. But if we if consider the problems without the, uh, the restriction on the, on the velocity, how can we recover the and also, we wanted to uh, to study the regularity or partial regularity of the estimation when gamma is pretty big. It's sufficient enough because when gamma is sufficient enough, the, the, the fluid more or less looks like an incompressible model. So, we may have some good results in this direction. Okay. So, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. So actually, the, the, the dimension, the dimension of the concentration, the cost of dimension of the concentration step will be given in terms of the density multiple function. So the density multiple function is more or less than the, the, the cost of the maximum function in the economic dimension. Yes. So, so actually, because, because this kind of um, the density multiple function is not derived by the, by the uh, and how of the radius. Okay, so, so this kind of uh, estimate of what do we ask in the duration? Why is this kind of concentration for the health? Okay. Any other question? Yes. I can have to back another very simple question. So uh, when you uh, talk about the uh, oscillation and concentration, you mentioned that, okay, for real time uh, as you square. So you know what I mean. So because you uh, you can control it right and so you only um, to talk uh, worry about it uh, uh, oscillate uh, oscillation uh they can just concentrate right uh, but for uh character that's the uh, real power gamma so there's no you 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 cannot control the gradient of row in, in general. So you need to consider both oscillation and concentration, right? So uh, yeah, I understand. Uh, that's always when ga um, gamma is the bigger than one. So so how about when gamma equals to one? So for example, you can say so when gamma is bigger than okay, one half of the uh, six dimension, the result is very big. Yeah. 
So first, Yang Chung is asking question. For now, I send traffic flow when heat transfer is taken into account. What is the latest result? Thank you. 